Okay, so today we're going to look at 1.5, which is on quadratic functions and how we transform them. Transformations are things like shifting left and right, shifting something up and down, or stretching it horizontally or stretching it vertically. Okay, so this is the um, form of a quadratic equation. f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. A, B, and C, well, B and C can be any number that you want, and A can be any number you want except 0. Because if A was 0 and you did 0 times x squared, 0 times anything is 0, you're going to wipe out the x squared term. Now all you're left with is BX plus C. That's not quadratic. That's a line, like MX plus B. Okay, so A, B, and C, any values you want except A cannot be 0. So positives, negatives, fractions, decimals, any real number. Okay, so I want to take a look at the graph of y equals x squared. Okay, make sure we know what that looks like. And then I want to look at, I'm going to look at two things. I'm going to look at putting a negative in there. But I'm going to look at putting the negative in two different ways. Okay, before we graph it, what's the shape called if you graph something that's squared? It's a quadratic equation, but what's the shape that it makes? Oh, James? It's a parabola. Okay, parabolas can either be opening up or they can open down. Let's look at y equals x squared. Just do a standard window, that's, that's fine. Okay, there's your parabola. Let's look at what happens when we put a, a negative in there. Okay, anybody have a thought what the negative is going to do to that picture? Yeah? Flip it. flip it which way? How about flip it over which axis? Yeah, it's going to flip it over the x-axis if you put the negative in like this. What that's going to do is cause all the y values to become negative. Okay, flipped it over. Now, if we do something like this, this is a little different. That still flips it. The reason that it looks the same is because it flipped it over the y-axis. Well, the y-axis is a line of symmetry for this picture. So if you reflect something over a line of symmetry, it looks the same. The only way I could show you that this is actually doing something is if I shift it off the line of symmetry. Okay. Let's say I take a graph and go like this. It's going to shift it three units to the left. Okay. Same parabola, just shifted to the left three units. Now if I put a negative in, instead of being in quadrant, mainly in quadrant two in this window, it's going to flip it over and put it in quadrant one. And that's if you put, whoops, that's if you put the negative inside the parentheses. When we put it outside, we saw that did something different. That flipped it over the x-axis. Now I just flipped it over the y-axis. Okay, so negative has something to do with, with flipping it. We're gonna we'll look at that as, as we go along. Okay, I already mentioned that the y-axis is a line of symmetry for the basic graph, y equals x squared. Yeah? Why is that the A, B, C, like at the very top? A, B, and C are elements of the reals. They are, member, they are real numbers. OK, so when you have a parabola, the low point okay, that we, we have in this case is called a vertex. Okay, the more mathematical name for this low point is called an absolute minimum. It is the lowest y value that the function ever hits. We touched on that a little bit with domain and range. But a parabola might also have a maximum value rather than a minimum. Okay? How would you get a maximum? 
Well, we saw an example when we flipped it over. It looked more like that. Right? The high point here is still called a vertex. It doesn't have a different name, but it's the absolute maximum instead of minimum. Algebraically, we can find the minimum and maximum very easily. Okay, we also saw that the calculator has two functions built in to do that, three and four, under calculate. You can find minimums and maximums of parabolas. <laughs> Questions? Okay, so what I want to do is try graphing some of these different graphs and see what happens when you change the number in front of x. So we already know what x squared looks like. Let's graph one third x squared. <coughs> okay, any guess what that's going to do if you compare that to x squared? Well, think about if you put one third in front. If you put in an x value, you're going to square it, and then the y is only going to be one third of what it was before. So all the y values are only going to be one third as high. What would that do vertically if you only make something one third as high? It would. It's going to compress it. Vertically. So what happens if you squish something down vertically, it does make it look wider. Okay. Now we can see that graph is much wider. If you plug in a number like 2, okay, what that's going to do is take what the y value would have been and double it. Okay. If you double something, that makes it taller. So what this graph is going to look like is stretched vertically. It's much skinnier. So what do you think the key thing to look for is with the number in front of x squared to determine if it's going to stretch it out vertically or compress it? What do you think we're, we're looking for? Whether this number is what? Cool. Well, think about what... When you multiply, what happens, what number do you go from making, when you multiply, making it bigger versus multiplying and then the number gets smaller? Wait. What's that? No, number. Think about, like, if I say to multiply by something, when is it going to get bigger? When you... Okay, start with this. When you multiply, when does it stay the same? One. Okay, if you multiply something by one, it stays the same. If you multiply by something bigger than one, then what happens? It gets bigger. It stretches, right? It stretches and gets bigger. Okay? So... That's, that's the key. Multiply by a number bigger than 1. That's going to stretch your graph vertically. Multiply by a number less than 1 but still bigger than 0. I'm not going to look at a negative yet. That's when the graph is compressed. Okay. You can say shrunk or we say compressed. Okay. Any, any question on that? If you graph more examples, you could see the bigger you make the number in front of x squared, the more that it stretches it. If you make the number in front of x squared really close to zero, like, say, one-tenth, it's going to really compress it. So now let's get into negatives. What did we say earlier that putting a negative in front did to it? Caused it to flip. Uh, Darren over which axis? The yeah, the x. Okay, putting a negative in front causes it to flip over the x-axis. So 
we don't need to go through that again. We already saw it. So with these graphs, there's two things happening. There's a stretch and there's a reflection at the same time. So we handle the negative and the number separate. And it's the same type of behavior with positives. If the number is smaller than negative 1, like negative 2, negative 3, numbers like that, it's going to stretch it. Numbers between negative 1 and 0 compress it. Okay? So I don't, I don't even want you to think of this negative um, at the same time as the stretch. Block the negative, just look at the number. If it's bigger than 1, it's going to stretch. If that number is less than 1, it's going to compress. A negative, that's a flip, and that's separate. Okay, so now what I want to do is write down what I would have to do geometrically to transform y equals x squared into y equals negative 5x squared. What's one thing I'd have to do to transform y equals x squared into y equals negative 5x squared geometrically? Yep. Flip it. Sure. So I'm going to reflect over x-axis. Technically, you could do that transformation first. The order here isn't going to matter. But in general, the order does matter. I'm going to give you a list of the order that you need to write them in in a little bit. Okay. What else do we have to do? So that takes care of the negative. It's going to reflect over the x-axis. Um, Jillian, how about the 5? Um, no. So think back to when we did those graphs. And what's going to happen if you have a number bigger than 1? Yeah, so that's a right, stretched vertically. Okay, so this graph is going to be stretched vertically. And then we just have to say by how much? By a factor of 5. So vertical stretch. by a factor of 5. Okay, those are the two things you have to do to transform y equals x squared to y equals negative 5x squared. Any questions on the two transformations? Let's try it again. Uh, let's look at this. So it's x squared plus 2. I want you to look at that. And x squared minus 3. What do you think is going to happen here? Let's start with y equals x squared plus 2. Any thought how that's going to compare to y equals x squared? It's not going to stretch it because we don't have a number in front of x. What could the plus 2 do? Well, Victoria? Well, think about the types of transformations we have. We're not stretching it. What else can we do besides stretch? Shrink. Yep, we're stretching, shrinking. We're not doing any kind of stretching or shrinking here. But it is going to do something to the parabola. So you have rotations. We're not doing a rotation. We're not going to do any rotations here. What's the other kind of transformations besides stretching and shrinking and rotating? Okay, flipping, that's good. If we had a negative in front, that's what's going to flip, reflect. Yep. It's going it. to translate it. We can either translate up and down or left and right. Okay, let's try it and see what we have. Okay, y equals x squared plus 2. So let's get rid of that and type in x squared plus 2. So what happened compared to y equals x squared? Kobe?
What did the plus two do? Yeah, shifted it up two units. Okay. So to get y equals x squared plus two, shift y equals x squared up two. How about x squared minus three? Before we even graph it, what do you think the minus three is going to do? Bria? It's going to shift it down three. Okay, I'll leave that one for you to try. If you want to try it, you can just plug it in. It'll shift it down three. So you get y equals x squared minus three. Shift y equals x squared down three. Okay, so these are vertical shifts. Vertical shifts are rigid motion transformations. They don't affect the shape of it. They only affect where the shape is. Rotations, reflections, translations, those are all rigid. When you stretch something, that's not rigid. You've changed the shape. Okay, so if you've got the graph y equals x squared plus k, and you want to get that from y equals x squared, if k is 0, you shift it up. Or if k is greater than 0, you shift it up, however many units k is. If k is less than 0, you're going to shift it down. And you're going to shift it down absolute value of k units. Why did I put absolute value here when shifting it down? Why just not write shift it down k units when k is less than 0? What would happen if you said that? Yep. Wouldn't that just not make sense? Why? How would it sound? It would sound like weird. Can you give me an example? Um, because if you say like shift down a negative amount, you can't move negative amounts. Right. Okay. If we say shift down negative three units, that doesn't make sense. So the shift is always a positive number. What you put in front of it specifies direction, up or down. Up or down takes care of positive or negative. So don't write um, on the test, shift down negative 2. That, that doesn't make sense. Just shift down 2, or whatever it is. Any, any questions on the vertical shifts? Okay. These are what you'd expect, positive up, negative down. Okay, I already graphed something like this earlier to show you a reflection um, when I wanted to not have it be symmetrical on the y-axis. These shift left and right. Does anybody remember which way a minus would shift? Well, Andy, which way do you think a minus would shift? Yep, which way? Left or right? Okay, so we have a guess for left. Why would you think minus would go to the left? Because on the x axis, the, the negatives are on the left. Yeah, that makes sense. So you'd think that if you put in a minus, it's going to shift to the left. Um, but it doesn't. Okay, when you have a minus, that's also going to shift it to the right three units. So this one is got to be careful with. If you do a plus, plus is going to shift to the left. All right, so let me write down how you would um, get those two. So to get y equals x minus 3 squared, you would shift y equals x squared. See, that would be to the right three units. Okay, and for the other one, to get y equals x plus 2, squared, shift y equals x squared to the left two units.
Okay, so it kind of feels like it's the opposite way that it, that it should be. But the way I try to remember it is I look at the number after the minus sign. That's all that I focus on. Look at the number after the minus sign. The number after the minus sign in x minus 3 squared is a positive 3. Okay, blocking off the minus sign. There's a 3. 3 is positive. That's going to shift to the right. In this one, x plus 2, there's no minus sign. But how could you think of x plus 2 with a minus? How would that be written? Oh, Colby? How could you write x plus 2 with a minus? x minus minus 2. Okay? So if you think of x plus 2 as x minus minus 2, if you look at what comes after the minus sign, it's a negative 2. That's going to shift to the left. That's why x plus 2 shifts left. Okay? So these are your horizontal shifts. Again, it's a rigid motion transformation. So, looking at the number after the minus sign, just the h, if h is positive, it will shift right. And that's why I'm encouraging you to just look at it as what comes after the minus sign. Then you don't have to think about it with that feeling kind of backwards notation. Okay, if what comes after the minus sign is a positive, you shift right. If what comes after the minus sign would be a negative, like x minus minus 2, then we would shift left. Any, any question about the horizontal shift? Yeah? Why does it work that way? Well, think about if it kind of has to do with if you were if solving the equation like um, 3 equals x plus 2. Okay. To get x by itself, do you do a plus 2 on each side, or do you have to reverse it and do the opposite? Wait, you get plus two on oh, I'm sorry, to get x by itself. Uh, you yeah, you have to do the opposite of what you see here. Right? So if you had a graph like y equals x minus 2 squared. And you try to think, well, if you think along that line, how would I get rid of this minus 2 if I could? You'd have to do the opposite of what you see, plus 2. Okay? And we could, we could go through algebraically, you know, point by point and, and look at that and see. But if you try to think of it that way, that, that might help a little doing the opposite of what you see. Okay. So just look at what's after the minus sign. If it's a positive, it shifts right. If it's a negative, it shifts left. So blocking the minus sign off kind of helps with that backwards feeling. Okay, And this is the form of an equation where all the transformations are involved. Uh, y equals a times x minus h squared plus k. Okay. What does the a do? You have a number in front, Augustine? Does it just kind of like make it like, uh, kind of the size of it? Well, squishes it or? Stretches or compresses? Yeah. Which direction? Vertically, yes. Okay, so the A stretches or compresses vertically. What does the H do? About Cody? Uh, it from left to right. Yep, it's going to shift it left to right. And what does the K do? How about um, Brianna? Um, it can moves it up and down. Okay, so those three numbers, those are the three things that can affect how the parabola is going to look. 
You might notice we're not doing stretching left and right. That's because we're just doing stretching up and down, and that, that's all we're going to do with parabolas. Okay, so if you want to know where your vertex is going to be, okay, when you shift it, A doesn't affect the vertex at all. It's H and K. Okay, so if you shift it left and right and then up and down, that's where your vertex would be. However many units you shifted left or right, that's H. And K is how many units you shifted up and down. Okay, the line of symmetry, a parabola is symmetrical over a vertical line. If you shift the parabola up and down, that has nothing to do with the line of symmetry. Those two parabolas have exactly the same line of symmetry. It's when you shift left and right. If I move it over here, the line of symmetry needs to move with it. That's why the only thing that affects the line of symmetry is horizontal movement, or the x value here of that vertex. Right? Shifting up and down has nothing to do with line of symmetry. Okay, so I want to look at an example and see if we can figure out the vertex and the line of symmetry. Let's start with the vertex. How about uh, James? What's the Start with the vertex, and we'll start with the horizontal. How many units did we shift this horizontally, and which direction? It's left. Yep, it's left. Two units. Left two units. So that's a negative two. Down three. Perfect. Down three. Okay. So the vertex is going to go from the origin, left two, down three. It's going to end up at the point negative two, three. Okay, my line of symmetry is vertical. Um, Jillian, how does the equation of a vertical line always start out? X equals. X equals. Yep. And now our line of symmetry is only affected by horizontal movement, not vertical. Okay. So, Kelsey, where will my line of symmetry be? So originally it was right at x equals 0. Right on the x equals 0 is the y-axis. But now it's been moved two units to the left. So where would that be? x equals negative 2. Remember, the h value of your vertex, that's the value you use for your line of symmetry, negative 2. This one we're going to look at the order that you do the transformations in. It does matter. Okay, and the reason that it matters is you could think of PEMDAS. Okay, think if I asked you to do 3 times 4 plus 2. If you do this properly, you get 14. 3 times 4 is 12, plus 2 is 14. If you do 4 plus 2 first, you get 8 times 3. That's 24. The order that you do it in makes a difference in the calculation in the final answer. Well, same thing here. If you switch the order that you do the transformations in, it comes out wrong. Okay, so we have to do them in a certain order. Okay, there's two transformations here. And you can kind of use PEMDAS to, to help you out. If you were to plug in a number for x, first thing you'd do is square it. That's the parabola part. And then what would you do after you square it? Go ahead, Colby. You multiply it by 5. What happens when you have a number in front of x squared? What does that do to your graph? I just want to describe it geometrically. Um, yeah. It's going to make it, um, gonna make it stretch. Yeah. Which way? Vertically. Yeah, it's a vertical stretch. And then you just have to say by how much by a factor of 5. All right, and the last thing we're going to do, um, Alex, what's the plus 4 going to do? It's going to move it to the left 4. 
if it was inside the parentheses, like x minus 4, x plus 4, that's going to shift it up 4. Yeah. They have to be done in that order. Let's look at this one. Same question again, just describe the transformations. Um, and then we can find the vertex and line of symmetry. Okay, there's going to be one, two, three, four transformations here. Okay, and we start with always what's inside the parentheses, just like PEMDAS. Okay, so Andy, what would be the first thing that would end up happening here? Yeah, cover up the minus sign, look at the number that you have left, it's a positive, positive, it's going to shift to the right. If you try to think of this as a negative one, it's just confusing. Block the negative, look at the number after, it's going to shift right one. Okay, shift right one. When you specify a transformation, you have to tell me what the transformation is and the direction and how much. It's a shift to the right one unit. Okay, next thing is we have a negative and a three. Those are two separate transformations. Let's start with the three. What's the three going to do? About oh, Bria? What does the three do? Geometrically, how is the three going to transform that function? You know, plus four is going to be a vertical movement. And help her out. What is that number? That's that's like the a. A in our formula. That's a. That's in front. Yeah, Darren. So is that number bigger than? Just looking at the number, bigger than one or less than one? Stretch. So it's going to be a vertical stretch by a factor of three. Now I want to look at the negative. What, what does the negative do? That's one of the first things we looked at. James? Flips it over the x-axis. Yep. That's a reflect, or you could say flipped over x-axis. In step four, that's the plus 4 at the end. And Bria, what does the plus 4 do? How many? Yeah, 4 units. Yeah. Shift up 4. So those are the four transformations you'd have to do exactly in that order to change y equals x squared into the equation above it. Okay, any questions on those four steps? Okay, as far as the vertex and line of symmetry, um, the vertex, well, it's been shifted right 1 and up 4. So your vertex is at 1, 4. Right 1, up 4 from the origin. Your line of symmetry, I don't care that we've shifted up. That has nothing to do with it. It's just been shifted right. Okay, so your line of symmetry is at x equals 1. Okay, these are the order that you do the transformations in. Now, we don't have horizontal stretching or shrinking in this section. If we did, we would squeeze it in right there. I didn't originally write it because we're not doing it in this, in this section, but we will be in the future. Okay, in this section, we just have horizontal shift, vertical stretch or shrink, then the reflection, then the vertical shift. Okay, so just steps one through four in this section, no, no one B. Okay, so make sure you follow that order when you write your steps. Okay, every example that we've done so far has been in a form that makes it easy for us to recognize what number is doing what. Right? In this form, we can clearly tell that A is the stretch. 
The H is horizontal movement. The K is vertical movement. But if this were to be foiled out, okay, pretend we had all numbers in there for A, H, and K. We could foil out X minus H squared, distribute out the A, and then add K. And then it would be in a form that would be harder to work with. That's the original form that I showed you. AX squared plus BX plus C, the very beginning of class. So what we're going to have to do is if they give us equation in AX squared plus BX plus C form, like 2X squared plus 5X plus 7, we can't tell what's being shifted left or right, up or down, or stretched. We have to take this equation and rewrite it like this. And the way that we'll do it is to complete the square. Okay, the, I'll, quit, I'll go through completing the square um, as we do the problem. Okay, so if you don't remember how to do that, um, it's important that you make sure you try to remember um, for the test how to complete the square. But I'll, I'll show you one example. How do you know when the reduction If the number in front is negative. It, this is not a completing the square problem that I would start off with if I was teaching somebody from scratch how to complete the square. Because this one covers all the things you have to do when you complete the square. It's a little more complicated. But because this is pre-cal, I'm going to show you the example that covers everything you could possibly have to do to complete the square. Some might be simpler than this, but they won't be any more complex than this. Okay, does anybody remember anything about completing the square? Okay, well, let's go through it. If you want to write the steps down that I'm saying to complete it, um, if you're not sure, that would probably be a good idea. So, step one, when you're completing the square. Put the constant on the other side. Okay. So I'm going to write my equation like this. Why did I change y to 0? Well, when we're completing the square, that's, that's how we do it. Because normally we use completing the square to solve the equation when it's equal to 0. We'll change it back to y at the very end. Okay. So I guess technically that's kind of the first thing you do. Then move the constant to the other side. How would I put negative 18 on the left side? James? Add 18 just, both just add 18 to both sides. Okay, step two. When you're completing the square, the coefficient of x squared has to be a 1. It can't be a 3. Okay, what could I do on the right-hand side here to make the coefficient of x squared a 1 and not a 3. Darren? Divide by 3. Yep, divide by 3. Or what's another, another way to do that? Because if I divide everything by 3, it's actually going to change the problem. But I am going to do something with a 3, kind of the reverse of distributive. Not quite. If a word that begins with an F. Yeah. Factor out a 3. The 18 is already on the other side. That's by itself. We have x squared plus 4x. Leave a little bit of space here. Okay, so now the coefficient of x squared is 1. Now we're going to do the actual completing the square step. To complete the square, you need to add a number to both sides of this equation. We call it like the magic number. The magic number is found in two steps. You take half of the coefficient of the middle term, and then you square that. Those are the two steps. Take half of the coefficient of the linear term and square that. So let's try it. Let's take half of 4. What's half of 4? Well, Alex? 2. two. And when you square 2, Cody? 4. four. So we're going to put a plus 4 there. 
Now we have to keep this equation balanced. So what do I have to add on the other side to keep it balanced? Because I can't just stick plus 4 on one side. I've just unbalanced the equation because I didn't do the same thing on both sides. So what do I have to put on the left side? And this is slightly tricky. Yeah? No, not add 4. If you add 4 to the left, that won't balance it. And this is why I would not show this when I'm teaching completing the square, because this is a, a little tricky for the first problem to show. But again, I'm hoping most people, are, maybe this jogs in their memory a little bit. 12? Yes, you have to add 12. Can you explain why 12? Because it's in the parentheses marks, and mm -hmm. everything in the parentheses marks are being times by 3. Right. So the number that you found by doing the two steps I explained, half of the middle term, 2, square it. 2 squared is 4. So you put a 4. But don't forget, there was a 3 that was factored out. So this isn't really a 4. It's a 3 times 4, or 12. So you added 12 on the right, and now you just added 12 on the left. So you kept it balanced. Simplify what's on the left. 30. And now if you found the number correctly to complete the square, this is going to factor very nicely. What does x squared plus 4x plus 4 factor into? It's going to factor into two binomials, and they're going to be identical, like x plus 9, x plus 9. That's not the answer, but it's, they're going to be the same. Yeah? X plus 2, x plus 2. X plus two. So it's x plus 2 squared. And now we just about have our quadratic equation in the form where we can see the horizontal shift, the vertical stretch. We just need the vertical shift back on the other side. So subtract 30 from each side. So we get 3 times x plus 2 squared minus 30. Now I can see, OK, I've shifted this to the left two units. I've done a vertical stretch by 3, and I'm shifting it down 30. Okay? I can't tell that when it's written like this, 3x squared plus 12x minus 18. Now, I'm not going to go through the steps, but you could describe, basically write down what I just said, how to get the transformation. The 3 would be a vertical stretch. So it's left. I'll write it just kind of with some arrows. So shift left 2. That's step 1. Vertical stretch by factor of 3. That's step 2. And step 3. Shift down 30. So we just answered the question. So it's easy to get the, the vertex now. The vertex is negative 2, negative 30. It's been shifted left 2, down 30 from the origin. Your line of symmetry is at x equals negative 2. But there's a shortcut if all you want to know is the vertex, and you have it in that form. I generally don't use these formulas because it's, it's a lot of extra work to memorize it, but it can be a shortcut if you want the vertex and you don't want to go through completing the square. All you have to do to find the ver vertex is take negative b and divide by 2a. And the y value of the vertex ends up being c minus b squared over 4a. You might notice part of the quadratic formula there a little bit. Kind of, maybe some similarities with it. Okay, if you want to try that in the last problem, I guarantee you you'll get the vertex negative 2, negative 30, using that formula. Okay. And the line of symmetry is just your x value of your vertex. 
The disadvantage to this method is if I ask you for the transformations, this does, doesn't tell you the vertical stretch. It would tell you left and right movement. It would tell you up and down movement, shifting. But these shortcuts will not give you the vertical stretch. You have to complete the square to find that. Okay, so the last thing they mention in this section is what's called a zero. Somebody brought it up earlier, or a root of a function. Basically, a zero of a function is where it crosses the x-axis. And quadratics can cross three different ways. You could have a parabola like this. It's up in the air, and it never crosses the x-axis. You could have one that just comes down, touches the axis, and goes right back up. So it crosses the axis one time. We say it has one root. Or you could have a parabola like that. Crosses the axis two times, and we say it has two roots. Tomorrow I'll show you on the calculator how you can calculate a root. It's kind of like an intersect, but it's with an axis. So you can't use intersect. You have to use root. And this part is from the quadratic formula. This is the part that's under the square root, b squared minus 4ac. If that part comes out less than 0, we have a problem. We're trying to take the square root of b squared minus 4ac in the quadratic formula. And if it's less than 0, that's a negative. So now you have imaginary answers. It would never cross the x-axis. So that's a quick way to tell which one of the three cases you have without actually drawing it. If you just do, take your equation that's in ax squared plus bx plus c form. Find out the value of b squared minus 4ac. Less than 0, it's never going to cross the x-axis. Equal to 0, it's going to come down, touch it, and go back up. That's one root. If b squared minus 4ac comes out positive, that's when you're going to have two answers. Right, so this just saves you a little time if I ask you how many roots does this equation have? That's A, that's B, that's C. Fill in A, B, and C and see is it less than zero, equal to zero, or more than zero. And that will give you your answers. And I think that was the last example, but I'm not going to. It's just arithmetic, so we don't have to go through that one. If you mess around with the calculator, see if you can figure out on your own how to find a root. If you can, I'll show you tomorrow. So that's the homework for tonight, page 56. Um, there's no range of problems. I kind of just skip around to 15 different questions. So it's 1, 2, 7, 8, 10, 11, 16, 18, 21, 22, 28, 33, 40, 41, 44 and 60.